Okay, everybody, welcome to our very last live stream for CENG4. Um, it is all being recorded, so if you can't be with us while we're doing it right now, it will be available later, so don't worry too much about that. Um, one thing that we haven't really been able to do yet, or that we just haven't found the time to do yet, is to talk about what we've seen around the campus um, with a, a particular eye towards how does that relate to what you're going to learn in the classroom. So we've seen some of the equipment around campus, um, but with the, the exception of the extra fuel cell um, lecture that I, I, or extra fuel cell discussion we had a little while ago, um, we haven't really talked about where you're going to encounter these things when you actually sit down in a classroom as part of your chemical engineering education. And so that's what we're going to cover today. We're also going to talk a little bit about what your degree looks like, even in the absence of these um, applications, right? Sort of the, the overarching view of your degree, which I think is great because most of the classes that you're going to be in, uh, with maybe the exception of 124, take a fairly... Um, I don't want to call it a limited view, but right, but they have a very specific topic that they're interested in conveying to you for that particular class. Uh, and so they, it's not often that they can kind of take the, the bigger view and put all of that stuff together and show you how all the pieces fit together. We kind of do it in 124, um, but we also sort of assume they already know it in 124. So eh, kind of. Um, so we actually have an opportunity here in this class uh, to put that kind of information together so that you have an idea of where all these pieces fit um, within your degree. So that's what we're going to start with, right? Sort of a, a high altitude view of what can you do with a chemical engineering degree, or not what can you do with it, what is inside of a chemical engineering degree when you actually take the classes, right? What are, what are those key features of a chemical engineering degree um, that separate it from a mechanical engineering degree or a chemistry degree or something like that? So let's start with that. I'm going to actually flip over here to... Um, PowerPoint, let's give this a little bit more space just so you can see everything that's on there. Uh, and the, the first thing that I wanna say about chemical engineering is there's four um, equations that are for the most part present in one form or another in all of the classes, right? Some of them to a greater degree than another, um, but they're, they're all there throughout the degree, right? You keep bumping into these um, over and over and over again. Uh, and like any good outline, um, we start with a meme because a meme is the best way to do this. Uh, and M-E-M-E -E -M -E, uh, is actually what I would use to abbreviate what are those four equations that we use everywhere. Um, so the first one is uh, material balance. Right, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about where these show up in each class here in a minute. There's a material balance, there's an energy balance. There's a momentum balance. And the last one's, I'm going to call it a balance. Um, it's an entropy balance. It's a little bit of a weird one, though, because all of the other ones, we can always very clearly say what's on the left and what's on the right. Um, but an entropy balance, actually, we can't do that. Um, we can only say that a certain sum of these quantities always gets bigger, or one is always bigger than the other. Um, but we can actually use that to, to make a lot of progress in, in various uh areas of, of chemical engineering. So nearly every course that we've got starts with these equations, right? It starts with some combination of a material balance, an energy balance, a momentum balance, and an entropy balance. Or if it doesn't use that exact equation, it may draw on it from a, a previous class. Um, all of these get put together for the general purpose of um, chemical engineering, which is to um, transform a low value product into a high value product, right? That's what we're trying to do, uh, which with each one of these units that we're gonna look at here um, in a little bit. Low value product to high value product, that's deliberately vague, right? It, the, the product may not be a physical thing that you can pick up and move around. Um, in most of the cases for the equipment that we're about to look at, it is something that, I mean, you might not wanna pick it up, right? It might be 700 degree exhaust from something. so you probably don't want to put your hand in it, but you potentially could. Um, that's not always the case, right? A, a low value product may be, you know, a contaminated ocean and a high value product may be a not contaminated ocean, but you can't just pick the whole ocean up and hold it, right? You can look at it and stuff like that. Um, but when we say product, we don't, we don't necessarily mean like 
I don't know, this candle, right, that I would go out and buy somewhere off of a, a store shelf. Um, we just mean that we have added value to something. Um, and that is, I would say, the, the overarching theme of chemical engineering, at least traditional chemical engineering. It gets a little bit more out there when you start doing uh, research in chemical engineering because that stuff's not always done with an eye towards I'm going to create a product, right? It, it takes more of an eye towards fundamental science of I just want to learn something new about a system. Um, so when we say low value product to high value product, we're, we're sort of focusing on what's traditional chemical engineering, right? Everything you can get through your BS and probably into your MS uh, and certainly the vast majority of industry positions, those are all aiming at taking a low value product and turning it into a high value product. How do we do that in each one of our um, classes? So we're going to quickly run through just the core courses. We're not going to hit every one of them, um, but I want you to see how often these show up um, inside your, your degree. So we've got our courses. We'll put those over here. I'll give you a brief description of what that course is, or at least how we think of it um, in terms of what major components are in there. Um, what does that course build on, right? What previously in your education might that course rely on to make a point? And then we also have a scale, right? We can either work on the micro scale or we can work on the macro scale. When I say micro or macro, what I mean is when you first sit down in that class, are the equations, the momentum, the energy, um, the material and the entropy balances, are those written with an eye towards a microscopic scale? So a very small element, and then they are scaled up to something bigger. Or when you first sit down with those equations, are they already taking the bigger scale, right? Process level scales of, you know, there's a certain amount of fluid in, in my finger or something like that and it's flowing out, right? And I'm looking at the whole finger as my system. So the macro scale is sort of the scale that you and I would interact with on an everyday basis. The micro scale is, it, it's certainly not unavoidable, right? We can definitely design products that operate on the micro scale, but it's primarily, at least through the undergraduate level, there as a calculation tool, right? We come up with a model for what the micro scale looks like, and then we scale it up to something that we would actually see on the macro scale. Uh, that's obviously not the case if your product or whatever it is you're working on is already at the micro scale, right? If you're use, doing microfluidics or nanofluidics or nanomaterials or something like that, you'll just be on the micro scale the whole time, right? Or the, the nano scale. I'm gonna up this light a little bit. There we go. Um, so we'll make a note of whether or not that class is taking a micro scale or a macro scale of a, a particular process. Um, and then we'll also explore whether or not that class is um, a core class, like it's in introducing a new core um, idea for the chemical engineering degree, or is it an application of ideas that have already been produced? Um, and then very briefly, we will um, indicate whether or not uh, it has applications or uses of those four equations that we just saw, right? The material balance, energy, momentum, and entropy balance. Um, up here we'll do uh, X will be a big use of that um, balance. Uh, actually, let's call them major and minor. Not major and minor in your degree, but if I put an X under the M here, that means it, it is a significant portion of that class that uses the material balance. Um, if I were to put a circle over here, it would mean a, a little bit of that class uses the entropy balance. Um, and then if it's blank, that class doesn't really come up to that, that equation at, at any particular time. So the first one that actually some of you might be in right now is 100, which is our material and energy balance class. Right from the name, we can very easily note that this is going to have a big impact or a, a, a big portion of it dedicated to using the material balance and the energy balance. It doesn't get to momentum and it doesn't get to entropy. So there, those will never show up inside of there. Um, it builds on your physics courses and your chemistry courses. So you just kind of walk into that class not knowing anything within the chemical engineering degree program in terms of the, the equations or the, the formats that, that we tend to use in there. Um, micro and macro, material and energy balance is purely macro. Uh, we briefly talk about some micro scale stuff, um, but not very much, right? It, it's taking the big view um, inside Senj 100. Uh, and this is definitely um, an exploration of the core 
uh, material balances and energy balances, right? It's not applying them to do something. It, it is like through the examples and stuff like that. But the point of that course is develop that core uh, because it's then going to be used um, elsewhere. I'm also going to go in the order that you will probably encounter them. Um, but if you are a transfer student, you might jump around a little bit um, because you could have two of these at the same time. Um, our 102 class is our thermo class. And that's definitely going to build on 100. It kind of builds on physics and chemistry. You'll, you'll probably have taken your, your thermodynamics section of your uh, physics by then, but it's mostly building on, on Sench 100. This again is going to take a macro scale to it, um, although they will get a little bit into the micro more so than they did in 102, or sorry, 100. Again, a core class. It, so I'm going to mark the material balance as, as minor. Um, it does, it, it's not minor in the sense that you don't need it a lot. It's just assumed that you already know that one inside and out, right? By the time the material balance comes up in 102, you'll have exhausted um, various forms of the material balance in 100. So it, it's, it's there, but it's not a huge portion of that class. Um, instead, 102 is going to focus on your energy balance and your entropy balance. Um, a momentum balance won't come up at all. Um, so the material balance is still there. In fact, you're going to actually see the material balance. It's, it's going to show up in one way or another on all of the courses. Um, it's just sometimes it's a big portion and, and sometimes it's, it's not. So those are your first two core courses. And as soon as you're done with those core courses, um, you can take your reaction engineering course, which I'm just going to call reactions. Um, that one we use 100 and 102 and don't really introduce a lot of new stuff. There's a tiny bit of new stuff in terms of like kinetics and models and stuff like that. Um, and again, this is taking a macro view. Uh, and this, though, unlike 100 and 102, is almost entirely an application of what you learned in 100 and 102. Like I said, there's a handful of new uh, equations that you need for like a kinetic model or a, a rate law or something like that, but they're, they're pretty mild. Um, instead, this is a big time application or a very intense application of material balances and energy balances. To a lesser extent, the entropy balance will be in there uh, because we have to bring up equilibrium. Um, but the, the big part of that will be a material balance um, and an energy balance. And then we're going to kind of quickly hit the three 101s. So there's a 101A, a 101B, and a 101C. Um, and 101A is your fluids course. B is your heat transfer. Uh, and C is your mass transfer. There is a re okay, having not come up with the naming the nomenclature for these courses, you know, the 101 series or something like that, it is convenient that those are the 101 courses because those are really the, the heart of most operations in, in chemical engineering. It all involves moving something around, heating it up, cooling it down, or moving mass back and forth between two different fluids. So it's convenient that those happen to be 101A. Um, 101A, or sorry, 101A, 101B, 101C. 101A uh, will mostly just draw on 100. Um, and then the other two will also draw on 100, but also 101A. So fluid flow um, is very important to heat transfer and mass transfer, but we don't really go the other way around. So the, the fluid mechanics course in, in 101A um, is sort of the basis for heat transfer and mass transfer. It, it doesn't really go the opposite way. Um, the emphasis in fluid mechanics is going to be on the micro scale. Um, there is a little bit of macro scale in there too. So I'm gonna put that in parentheses. The, the primary emphasis is, is micro. Um, and then similarly, when you get to heat transfer and mass transfer, I'm gonna just write them as micro um, because the balances that you're gonna write in there for your material and energy balances and, and momentum balances, for the most part, start at the micro scale, right? They're, they're taking the view of, maybe a few thousand molecules put together, right? And that's that's pretty small, um, especially for, for chemical engineering. All three of these are going back to core principles, right? They're going to have some examples in there to show you how to apply them, obviously, but the purpose of that course is to develop these core ideas. Uh, fluid mechanics, again, is going to, actually all three of them are going to need a material balance, but only the mass transfer one is really going to hit you hard with the material balance again. Um, 
the uh, energy balance inside 101A is again, kind of small, um, the same way that it's material balances. The big one in fluid mechanics now is your uh, momentum balance. Um, and this is the first time that you get introduced to the momentum balance. That by the way, tends to be why one of the many reasons why 101A is one of the harder courses in our curriculum, it's the first time you hit the momentum balance. And there's a lot of stuff in there that you haven't been exposed to before. Um, it's a fairly complicated expression. Uh, and it, it just doesn't behave the way that the static pieces of equipment do. And that tends to be what most people have been exposed to up to that point. Um, that and there's just a ton of material inside 101A. Um, the entropy balance, it comes up like once for like 10 minutes in one reaction. So I'm, or in one lecture. So I'm not going to put that one, um, inside of there. Your heat transfer class obviously has a really big, um, energy balance component to it to a lesser extent. It's also got the momentum balance because it'll involve, um, fluid flow. And then the mass transfer class doesn't really have any energy balance. Um, but it hits a little bit harder or sorry, a little bit on the momentum balance again. Um, so you can kind of see that B and C there are, are similar in the sense that one's doing an energy balance in more detail and one's doing the material balance in, in more detail, but they both rely on 101A because they're usually, uh, focused on how does fluid flow and transfer heat or how does fluid flow and transfer mass. Um, one of those two. That sort of ends your, your junior year, right? If, if we're um, dividing these by what year you're doing everything, uh, this is your sophomore year, this uh, is your junior year, and now we're getting down to your senior year um, down here on the bottom. Um, in your senior year, there are four classes. Um, there's actually six classes, but two of them are repeats, so I'm only going to write them once. There's 120, 122, 124, and 176. 120 is kind of an oddball. Um, it's oddball in the sense that it's a topic that we haven't really talked about at all prior to this, which is controls. How do you control various pieces of equipment? So it's things like sensors and feedback loops and feed forward loops and computer control and this sort of stuff. It's primary, um, basis on which it builds is 100, but it also just flat out needs some math. So you'll, you'll sort of come back to your differential equations. Um, how did you solve differential equations? How do you solve partial differential equations? Um, by the time you get to controls, we kind of switch back now that we're into applications to the macro scale. Um, and this is definitely an applications based class. So we don't introduce any new balances, right? There's no new application of a material and energy or a momentum or an entropy balance. It's just how do we apply them in such a way that we can now control the level or control a temperature or control a reaction rate or something like that. So it kind of gets all of the three core ones, the material energy and momentum balance. The entropy balance doesn't really come up as much um, inside of uh, the controls class. In fact, I'm actually going to take the momentum balance off because it, it takes such a large scale that the momentum balance um, usually doesn't show up. Your 122 class will be your separations. So that's saying if I have a mixture of something, how do I unmix it? And that's usually the case with chemical engineering because if you make something by a chemical reaction, it's all mixed together when it comes out of the reactor. And now you've got to pull out the stuff that you want and maybe the stuff that didn't get reacted and send it back through, um, all that sort of stuff. So separations actually draws on a ton of them. I got to write these kind of small. Um, it draws on 100, 102, and 101C, right? Material and energy balances, thermodynamics, and mass transfer. It again takes mostly a macro scale approach, um, and it's looking at applications, right? What are the actual pieces of equipment that we walk around or that we operate things with um, that actually will end up separating something? So very much an applications based um, course. This one will make various use of all four of the major conservation equations. It doesn't hit any of them more, I would say more than another. Um, it it kind of needs them all in equal proportions. So separations is another um, tough class. And then the last two classes that you end up taking um, is your process engineering class, which is 124, uh, and your lab course, which is basically a process laboratory course. Um, the 
process engineering and the lab course uh, are both what we call capstone courses, right? So they need everything that you've done up to there. They, again, primarily focus on a macro scale. Uh, and they are, again, um, applications of core principles in, in chemical engineering. There is some new stuff in there, right? So 124 is the first time that you're going to encounter um, safety devices that we have like, you know, blow out valves and, and um, emergency alarms and uh, safe design and all that sort of stuff. Uh, and then in 176, it's more about how do we communicate, right? How do we write a report? How do we uh, understand a number to be one number and not another one? So your stats class will, will come in through there. Um, and similar to separations, you're going to need kind of a little bit of everything here uh, because the topics that you will encounter um, in your capstone courses are by design drawing from everything that you've um, experienced up until now. So this is sort of what your um, degree ends up looking like. Uh, and so I hope that that gives you some idea of why it's organized the way that it is, right? It start, sort of starts, starts off with these core um, in your sophomore years, a little bit of an application there with 113. Your junior year is primarily dedicated to building up your core knowledge of these topics in chemical engineering that are so important, fluid mechanics, heat transfer, mass transfer. And then when you transition into your senior year, you're now starting to apply all of these things, right? So we end up uh, sort of, there's lots of X's up here, uh, and then there's almost all O's down here, right? Because we're, we're sort of done introducing the balance equations as major components of a course, and we're now assuming that you know them um, and applying them to uh, whatever the next topic is. And similarly, right, there's, there's a few more X's in your so sophomore year because we're really trying to build up that uh, knowledge base that you have of the, the four conservation equations. And then by the time you get into your junior year, there's a little bit more of a balance between developing um, those equations as new equations uh, versus applying the equations, um, having already seen them. So that's roughly how your degree is structured as you um, transfer through uh, or, or pass your way through um, the chemical engineering program. So what I want to do now is talk about some of the pieces of equipment. I'm going to pick on like three and a half. Um, I'm going to bring up a fourth one, but I'm not going to go into a lot of detail of it uh, because I've already got that in a, a separate lecture. Um, and I want to talk about what this piece of equipment would look like from the standpoint of a chemical engineer, right? When I walked in front of this, what did I see when I thought about where this shows up inside of your um, curriculum? So we're going to go through um, a couple of minutes of some of the videos, um, and I'll talk about um, various elements of, of each one. So the first one that we're going to start with is the um, control room that we saw uh, in the first few minutes of our, our second video. So let me put this over here. We'll go here. Um, and we're going to watch a couple, just maybe a minute or so of it so that we're all on the, the same page again. I'll pull the volume down. So we have down a, a jet bit. engine that drives a generator. The jet engine drives a generator and makes electricity. The heat that comes out of the jet engine is 1400 degrees. So we send it through a catalyst to clean it to reduce our emissions. And then the heat goes through a heat recovery steam generator, which makes 62,000 pounds of steam. So that's why we call it a cogeneration. Co is two. We use one form of energy, which is natural gas, to drive the engine. But in doing so, we get two forms of energy, electrical energy and thermal energy in the form of steam. All right, so let's take a look at what um, Tom's talking about here. I'm going to rewind it a little bit, um, yeah, just enough so that his hand isn't in there. Let's go back to about here. Jade engine. Move your hand, Tom. normal, regular yeah. base load that we have. That's in it. I would have thought we would at least be able to reduce it a little bit, but no. Scooch I guess that's forward a little bit here. Drives a generator. The jet engine drives a generator. And that's close enough. His finger's out of the way, so we can work with that. So when we look at something like this, the, the first thing that's going to show up here that you probably haven't needed before um, is what's called a process flow diagram. And so uh, Tom is actually pointing to a process flow diagram that's a little bit more, this is actually more like a process and instrumentation diagram because it shows instrumentation on there. 
But this is the kind of thing that you'll first encounter inside of uh, Senj 100. So everything in Senj 100 is a box. And in fact, almost everything in all of our courses are drawn as a box. So the turbine that he's got here would just be a box and we would count that as a reactor. What it went to afterwards, as Tom mentioned over here, was another reactor, right? This was his uh, catalytic uh, reactor that sort of cleans up the exhaust. And then the last thing that it went to over here was our steam generator. This one, eh, we don't really have a, a, a name for it or something like that. But generally our process flow diagrams that we first introduce in 100 um, are all dealing with boxes and flows going into and out of it. So we would do material and energy balances on each one of these boxes. Our first reactor uh, is generating some shaft work over here. Let me erase that and get a slightly better. For whatever reason, we uh, usually denote work uh, with a squiggly line. So there's some shaft work coming out of this one. Um, there's air coming into it over here. Um, and then there's also natural gas coming in um, over here. So this would be our CH4 uh, that's coming in through there. The product of that, like he said, is quite hot. Um, and so that product gets exhausted over here to our reactor. Um, or it's, it's, it's a second reactor, right? This one was our, our catalytic converter coming out through here. This one appears to have a couple of feeds going through it, but I'm not exactly sure what these additional feeds are, or actually if those are even going in or out. It looks like they're connected over here somewhere to some uh, cold water, but I'm not entirely sure. At any rate, once we clean it up, um, that gas then goes into our boiler uh, and the boiler has two inputs and two outputs. So on the one hand, there's hot gas coming in uh, and on the other hand, there's warm water coming in or I should say cold water coming in. Uh, coming out of the boiler through the top uh, will be our high pressure steam. Uh, and then a little bit of exhaust coming out through here, right? So this is the stuff that finally goes out to the atmosphere, right? It's been cleaned up, it's been cooled down. Uh, we can't get any more reasonable amount of energy out of it. Um, and so we're going to uh, send it off to um, the atmosphere. We're gonna vent it. The incoming water over here, uh, I can't really draw all of these because they start crossing each other over here. Uh, this is water. Right? It's usually going on a loop, right? That high pressure steam is going off to um, something else. You can actually see the name briefly over here. This is BFW, which is boiler feed water. Uh, and up here at the top is HPS, which is high pressure steam, right? The high pressure steam is the product. The boiler feed water is the, I should say the high pressure steam is the high value product. The uh, boiler feed water is the low value product. So again, that's not one that's a product in the sense that we put it on a shelf somewhere. Um, it's a product of that particular unit. So what you're seeing here um, is what we would uh, encounter primarily in CNG 100. Um, so I'm gonna list these over here. So the first time you encounter flow diagrams like that will be in CNG 100. Um, there's also a few smaller things that are sort of built inside of each one of these that I'm gonna highlight. Um, if we take a look at this reactor, right? The first one, which is our um, turbine, that class is going to draw a lot on not just 100, um, but also 102 um, for energy transfer, uh, 113 for reaction kinetics uh, and 120 for controls. I'm gonna actually change that. Let's write these in black so that you can see them a little bit better. Um, so 100, uh, 102, 113, and 120, right? All of those are courses where you would encounter something like a reactor, right? There's a material and energy balance, there's a chemical reaction, and obviously the control of it is, is quite important. Uh, the next one, uh, right next to it, which is our, our catalytic unit over here. I don't know exactly what the um, reactions are that take place in there, but that one is definitely going to have 113 elements to it um, because there's a chemical reaction, um, as well as, again, controls. And I'm going to try to avoid writing <clears throat> on the side of uh, Tom's monitor there because it's a little bit hard to read. Um, so again, controls will, will show up. And then our last one is our boiler over here. The boiler actually uses almost everything. So the boiler, uh, you'll encounter boilers in material and energy balances, in thermo, uh, definitely fluid mechanics, uh, as well as heat transfer, uh, and then controls again. So notice one thing that shows up again and again, right? Controls, controls, 
controls. In fact, controls are, are sort of embedded inside of this picture that he's got here. We just can't see them because um, these units over here on the right, these are your controls. Right, and that's the kind of stuff that we would be looking for in 120 of, you know, there's a certain temperature of fluid coming in. These are actually the um, cooling tower controls that he shows over here. There's a certain temperature of water coming in. If it's got a particular flow rate, how fast does the fan need to go based on the humidity outside uh, in order to maintain a constant outlet temperature on the other side, right? So controls comes up a lot. Um, in fact, we're going to mention that on, on almost every one of these uh, that we've got uh, coming up for each one of these pieces of equipment. So let's take a quick um, screenshot of that. We'll, we'll throw it over onto our um, PowerPoint just so we don't lose it anywhere. Copy that. Come over here uh, and we'll sort of talk about, oops, that's not what I wanted to do. I need control shift M. There we go. Let's go ahead and paste that in there. Move that up a little bit. So now we've kind of got that where we will hopefully refer to it again. Um, a couple of things that we weren't able to see while we were there that I want to talk about a little bit more. One of them is the actual turbine itself. So I've got a picture of a turbine over here. Um, if you would like to see this, Tom will show it to you. Um, give Tom and shoot him an email or shoot me an email if you if you want to walk over there. This is very close to the turbine that they have um, operating in there. It's ours is slightly smaller, but not that much smaller. Um, but if if you want to go see it, Tom will will be more than happy to show it to you. Uh, the major elements of the um, turbine are the compressor over here. Right, so air is going to kind of come in through this side of your um, compressor. It's going to get to a very high temp, uh, well, very high pressure. Temperature will go up even higher. Uh, I'm not circling the person there. I'm trying to circle the unit that's behind him. Um, this is the combustion chamber. Uh, and so this is where your CH4 gets added. Uh, and then this section over here is your exhaust coming out. Right, so that's what would then go off to um, the catalytic converter that they have at the plant that would clean it up um, and then eventually run it through um, the boiler so that they can get the, the cogeneration, right? They get electrical power directly from this uh, turbine as it, it spins that electrical power is, um, or the mechanical power of the spinning is converted to electrical power through a generator. Uh, and then our other element of cogeneration is the, the hot exhaust coming out here. So we should note that this is very hot. Um, they usually don't pull it apart like that, right? If, if you are standing in front of it and it's operating and it's pulled apart like that, you probably won't be standing there too much longer um, because something terrible has happened. But they do take it apart and clean it every once in a while. Um, and at the very least, you can get you can ask Tom to open the doors on the side. Um, they, the whole thing is inside a sound insulating uh, tank, basically. Um, and you'll be able to see mostly this from the outside. Um, and it's quite noisy. Uh, which is why it's inside of its, its sound insulating blanket. This is something that would come up inside of um, specifically material and energy balances and thermo. Um, and then the reactions might occur in something in like um, 113. The other element that I wanted to talk about is that boiler. Um, and we're gonna talk about this in a couple of different applications because there's a couple of different ways that we transfer energy from a hot fluid to a cold fluid. And it all depends on the flow that you wanna use. Um, the ones that we usually start teaching you about. The very first ones that um, you learn about are what are called co-flow um, or concurrent flow, or here they've called it co-current flow. Uh, and here, both the cold and the hot are going in the same direction, right? They're both going in, in this image over to the right. Um, over here on the concurrent flow, or sorry, the countercurrent flow, now they're going in opposite directions, right? The, the cold is going this way and the hot is going this way. Cross flow is kind of a weird one um, where one's going down or up and down and one is going left and right. In practice, I, I would say the most common heat exchangers that we have, this, this would be close to what a, actually that's not even a cooling tower. Cross flow, 
there's a few cooling towers that run on cross flow, but it just doesn't come up a lot. Um, we usually have this hybrid version over here, right? Which is a combination of cross flow and counter flow. Um, usually it's actually reversed from this, right? One of the fluids is going in this way and the other fluid is actually going in this way so that it's generally making its direction, making its way towards the entrance. But as it does, it snakes through this series of pipes uh, in order to make it over to um, the inlet. So the counterflow hybrid is actually the one that comes up most often, um, and it comes up through a heat exchanger. These heat exchangers kind of look the same for um, evaporators, for the chillers that we talked about, for the boilers. They're all generally constructed in the same way. Unfortunately, we weren't able to see any of these broken apart over at the um, cogen, uh, but I was able to find a pretty good picture of one um, that gives you the, the, it's not actually a picture, it's a model. Um, let's draw this, make that a little bit bigger. This is sort of what a traditional heat exchanger looks like. The element that you probably notice first is all of the tubes. There are tons and tons of tubes in here. Um, and actually we're gonna see another clip in a little bit where Tom mentions it's something like well over a thousand tubes um, go in here. And so one of the fluids, it could be hot or cold, it could be liquid or gas, it, it doesn't really matter. Uh, one of them comes in through all of these little uh, tubes. The version that we've got here, the fluid would actually make its way down and then turn around and come back. But it never leaves those tubes, right? It just goes down and makes a U and comes back. Um, I believe this one is called a floating head uh, because this uh, piece over here is, is free. Floating head, they might need to get rid of some of these baffles. I, I can't remember exactly how many, how much room you have to hear, have out there to have a, a floating head. Um, this could be a fixed head one. But at any rate, there's this U shape to it. Um, and so it, it might go in one direction um, hot and come out cold, or it could come in cold and go out hot. Again, it could be a liquid, it could be a gas, it, it, it really doesn't matter. Um, the key feature is this tube bundle that you have on here. It's thousands of these tubes, usually copper um, because it, it transfers heat pretty well, uh, but it, it may not be copper if it's something that is um, particularly corrosive, right? It, it could be some form of steel, um, depends on what the, the corrosion is like. That fluid uh, is initially coming in through here. Uh, it kind of makes a, a bend through here, but on the edge cap over here is a, a solid plate, right? It can't go straight down. Um, it's forced to go through along sort of this plane. And then when it comes around and comes out through the bottom, it's now underneath here and coming out in this direction, right? That's why this is an inlet and this is an outlet. Uh, and it's divided by the tubes, right? There's a flat sheet and then it stays inside the tubes as it, it goes around. The other element is whatever the other fluid is. Um, and so I'm gonna draw this one in blue, um, but it doesn't necessarily have to be blue. Uh, it, it's not like this is the cold, um, but usually this one has an inlet coming up this other side. So you can kind of see the little fitting over here. This is another inlet. This fluid flows over the outside of the tubes. Um, and typically it, it takes kind of a snaking path to kind of go around like this until it eventually comes out um, over here. Um, and this is another outlet. So any heat exchanger, any boiler, any chiller, any condenser, they all have something in common, which is they generally have two inlets and two outlets. Um, and then they also have the thing in, in common of lots and lots and lots of tubes. So you wonder why we hit flow in a tube so hard on so many things, um, because it comes up in so many places, because it's an easy way to increase surface area. Um, the, the process of heat transfer and mass transfer are both facilitated by higher um, heat transfer areas or mass transfer areas, but we usually don't want those things to actually mix, right? We t tend to spend a lot of money keeping things separate. So how do we spread something out, but still keep it separate from whatever the other fluid is? put it inside a tube. If you need a lot of them, then you need lots of tubes, right? You need thousands of tubes or, or, or something like that. So try to keep this in mind. I'll, I'll come back to this picture in a moment because it's um, gonna come up on a couple of different pieces of equipment. Um, but just keeping in chronological order of the way that we viewed them in our live streams. The next thing that we saw was um, a cooling tower. So let me grab the appropriate uh, clip that we need for our um, cooling tower. 
and we'll go watch that for a couple of just like a minute or so um we're gonna watch our initial visit out to the cooling tower so 76 degree water going into the top and then it goes through a pvc manifold with a bunch of pipes that go out the side with nozzles on the bottom and the goal is to break the water up into droplets creating more surface area so when the droplets fall down up top you have the fan spinning pulling air in the bottom and you can see the water kind of getting pulled in that's from the air so the air passes underneath the water falls down therefore cooling it again very simple okay so um Actually, we've got a, a good view right here. What's the low value product and the high value product in um, a cooling tower? The low value product is the hot water um, that is coming in through the, the top of the tower. So, oops, let's get some purple here so you can actually see it a little bit. Erase that. The water is coming in through here. I, I can't draw into the uh, screen here. This is your warm water. Right, and this is your low value product. Why is it low value? Because we need cooling water, right? The, the purpose of this uh, unit is to make cooling water. Um, also, there's kind of an imaginary division here. There's two cooling towers next to each other. Um, once it goes inside of there, as Tom said a moment ago, it hits what's called a manifold. So inside of here is a pipe. Uh, that water spreads out inside that pipe. Hey, there's pipe flow again. Uh, and then it rains down through the tower. It's a little bit higher than I've drawn it right here. Um, once it goes through the um, manifold, it's sort of spread out. It has a very high surface area. It's split up into droplets. Uh, and then it hits a fill that is underneath, which I'm just going to draw as sort of a hatching underneath here. And the idea of the fill is, well, I spent all of that effort, I had to get a pump to actually pump this water in here, spread it out into droplets. I needed to stay separated. Um, and so the manifold up here spreads the water out. Um, and then the uh, fill that's underneath it keeps the water spread out, right? It'll run down the fill and form kind of a form, uh, a film on the um, surface of the fill, but it, it generally stays separate. And then by the time it comes out of the fill, uh, there's an opening down here. It takes droplets again. Um, and then the water eventually exits through uh, the bottom of the tank. This is our cold water. And this is our high value product, right? So this is what we've been trying to make is high value cold water, which can then be used to cool down other equipment or transfer heat out of a different process stream or, or something like that. There's two streams that we didn't talk about here, which is air, right? Obviously the fan up here at the top, which we were able to go see uh, while we were out and about um, is one. So our air is coming out through here. And this is by means of that giant fan. Where is the air coming in? Well, that's why there's an opening here, right? The air is being sucked in through here. So this is our inlet air is coming in through the side. You can actually feel it if you go out, the, if you want to ask Tom if you can go stand in front of these things, by all means do so. He, he loves to have people visit. Maybe not right now while we're in the middle of COVID, but shortly thereafter. Uh, but you can stand in front of there and, and feel the, if you're facing the tower, you'll feel the air uh, being pulled past you into um, the tower, if, assuming the fan is on and, and it's it's fairly high. So as I mentioned a moment ago in uh, the process flow diagram that we saw in the control room, this would be again something that we would try to mimic um, in like Ascend 100 or something like that uh, by drawing it as a box and saying, okay, there's an inlet and there's an outlet, and maybe that's our warm water and our cold water, and maybe there's an inlet and an outlet for our air. Um, and that's all we would do in, in 100, right? The whole thing would just be a box. And then as we go through more and more of our um, courses, we would add more and more detail to each one. Um, so if, if this is the Senge 100 approach here on, on Tom's head of just a, a box with inlets and outlets, right? That's fairly macro scale. Some of our other courses that would show up would be 101A, um, 
to design that manifold and know how big of a pump we would need to actually run that manifold. The fill that's down here in the bottom would be an interesting one. That would probably come in in 101C. Um, and then we actually mentioned it a little bit more in 176 of, of what makes a good fill. Um, what are the characteristics of the, the fill that we've got? And then there's a couple of other ones that are not quite as, as visible. So you can actually see here by the side of, of Tom's shirt, there's a pump over here. Um, and this is something that we focus a lot on in 101A. We need to be able to size those pumps, right? How much energy do those pumps require? Um, sometimes how much do those pumps cost to actually operate? Um, we may or may not get that far. It sort of depends on where you are. Uh, and then similar to a pump is a fan, right? Up here at the top is our fan. Right, and our, our fan is again something that we would um, address in something like a 101A. This one also, both the, the pump and the fan are very common control units. Um, so not only in 101A, but also in 120. Right, we, the manifold, why not you know, say controls for the manifold or controls for the fill? Because there's nothing you can do to them, right? Once they're installed, they're static objects. Um, there's there's you can't use those as a control element because you can't change them while the thing is actually running. But the pump, you can play with the pump or maybe play with a valve um, nearby uh, and you can play with the fan and adjust um, both of their speeds uh, as, a, as a control element. So um, 101A, 120, uh, to an extent 100 for, for an initial view of it. Um, and then even the, the fill, um, Actually, we're going to talk about the fill more in a moment. There are other types of fill that you're going to encounter in 122, um, and I'm going to show you a, a few of those uh, in a moment. So lots of chemical engineering sitting inside of the um, cooling tower. Let's get a quick snapshot of this just so that we uh, have a record of it. Throw that onto our clipboard. Um, oops, always forget. Put that over here. Um, and so the uh, thing I wanted to mention about the, the fill, the ones that are actually used inside of the cooling tower that we just saw um, is what's called a um, structured fill, right? Um, this fill, not right, I guess you wouldn't know. So I shouldn't ask you if that's right or wrong. Um, this is called a structured fill. Hey, hide. There it goes. Uh, this is a structured fill. The reason it's called a structured fill is because it's structured, right? Th this is actually a block of plastic, um, and you can you can pick them up like a piece of wood or something like that and move them around. And if you want to take them out of the um, cooling tower, then you just pick them up, take them out, maybe pressure wash them down to get anything uh, growing on them off of them. The only downside to this uh, structured fill, well, I don't want to say the only downside. One downside to that structured fill is uh, that you can't actually get inside of the structured fill. So let me get my uh, red pen out here. So the water is going down through uh, these openings on the top, right? It's coming down in this direction and I can't access those openings. Um, it, it sort of falls down and it hits the, imagine we've kind of got a cutaway here, right? It falls down, uh, it hits one of these ridges and then it kind of runs its way down the ridges um, this way. And then the sheet that's um, right next to it has ridges going the other way. So the water is, is falling sort of in a crisscross direction going down. And meanwhile, the air is coming up through uh, the entire um, system. But you can't get in there and clean it out. Um, th these things are well, yeah, they're well plastic welded together. Um, and so they're kind of stuck. Another form of fill that we saw on the second cooling towers um, that we went out to um, out by the um, fuel cell was this sort of uh, hanging fill. It's still um, structured fill, but this is actually hanging up and down. Um, and so these were the, if, if you go back to that uh, movie or the, the live stream that we did out by the fuel cell, uh, you'll see actually Tom picks up a couple of these, right? And kind of 
peels them backwards. They look like big old sheets of, of paper or something like that. Um, these are hanging inside of uh, a cooling tower. The advantage to these, as is kind of shown here, um, when you take the thing apart, you can just slide them back and forth. Uh, so you can pull them out, pressure wash each side, and then put them back in. So you can clean them a little bit more easily um, in case there's any fouling or anything on there um, that might be interrupting your, your mass transfer or heat transfer in this particular case. The last one that I want to mention is not a fill that's often used in a cooling tower, um, but it is a fill that's used a lot in uh, things which rely on increasing surface area. Uh, and so these, let me make this a little bit better, bigger. These types of fill um, are called random fills. They're also called uh, dumped packings because you literally dump them into a cavity, right? You've got a big cylinder or something. Each one of these, uh, you know, this one right here, that's about the size of a ping pong ball or maybe slightly smaller than something like that, right? Each one of these are, are actually, they're about the size of an eyeball. That'd be a good size. I don't, we don't often dump eyeballs into process equipment, um, but it, it's been known to happen, I'm sure. Each one of these uh, sh uh, appears inside of the tower in a way that's different every time, right? It's random. You just take them all and you dump them all in there. But they all have a, a similar feature to them, which is a very high surface area to volume ratio, right? So the idea is to try to leave plenty of room for a gas to flow through um, and then simultaneously spread out the liquid. So if a liquid were to hit this burl saddle up here, it would kind of fall down over here or maybe it hits here. Uh, and falls off over here, right? It, it's trying to, to keep that liquid spread out as much as it can. This interlocks saddle might hit here and then run off to the side on either side uh, while the air kind of comes up and gets redirected or the gas, whatever it happens to be coming up this way. Um, lots of clever little designs. You know, there's a, a little plastic twirl down here. Uh, this one I love that there was a time in chemical engineering where all you had to do was create a cylinder and you can name it for yourself. Um, it's called a rashig ring. It's just a cylinder. That's all it is. Somebody took a pipe and cut the pipe into little cylinders and then dumped all the cylinders inside the, the uh, unit and they got to call it a rashig ring. You can't really do that anymore, but boy, it was great back in the day. It, it didn't take a lot to get your name put on um, something like that. So this is the other type of fill that we use, and it's why I had mentioned uh, 122 um, as another course that's sort of related to um, cooling towers in the sense that a lot of separation processes use these uh, random or these dumped fills, or um, actually we can also, all of this is also called packing. So when we say packing, that's sort of the overarching uh, term for, for every one of these. Um, the advantage of a um, dumped fill or a random fill is that you can make them out of expensive material um, a little bit more easily, right? If they needed to be ceramic, for example, in order to ha handle very high temperatures, um, you could not design a structured fill like this or a structured fill like this out of ceramic because it would just shatter, right? You'd ship it around or you'd be installing it and it would shatter and you get a bunch of broken dishes down at the bottom of your, your unit or something like that. So the, the random fill and the dumped fill is often used when the conditions are harsh and you need a, a fairly um, unusual piece of material, right? If it's just plastic, then it's probably just a, a structured fill or a, a hanging fill or something like that. So again, lots of um, chemical engineering sitting right there. The one that I'm going to skip, um, let's go back for um, a moment. I'm just going to review the uh, video really quick, but we're not going to go over it um, in the same level of, of detail that we did here a moment ago, uh, is the fuel cell. Um, and so let's let Tom sort of review the fuel cell here. Not a lot to watch on this one. You've got, what you say, it was 2.4 or 1.2 1.4 and 1.4. 1.4 and 1.4. 1.4 and 1.4. So yeah, megawatt and a half, megawatt and a half. Yeah, I mean, it's it's just amazing. You can get right up next to the thing and you don't hear anything. Yeah. It's just, it's dead silent sitting over here. I mean, you hear a little bit of gas flowing around here and there, but I guess all the noise is actually coming from all the support equipment outside of the cell. Yep, the blowers and the... Huh. 
So the actual chiller is. Yeah, let's. So actually, I, I just want to leave it on here. Let's go back to where we can actually see everything. There we go. That's a good view um, of what we've got. Go ahead and uh, clear our annotation on here. So the, the fuel cell is the sort of third one that I wanted to talk about, which by the way, the, the fuel cell is this structure here. It's this big box um, that we're dealing with. Everything else is supplemental for the, the fuel cell. Um, this is the fuel cell's exhaust. So hot gas uh, is going out here. The um, supply line to the, the fuel cell is actually sort of over on the other side. Uh, and so what would be coming into the fuel cell uh, would be like a biogas. Um, maybe it's from algae, or I think Tom mentioned that they at one point were using kelp, um, the big sort of tree-like things that grow at the bottom of the ocean, um, or maybe from a landfill, right? A landfill is collecting biogas. Um, all of those are, are basically the same thing, right? Which is methane, CH4. Especially if it's, you know, waste, a waste dump or something like that, and everything out there is just breaking down as usual, um, you might as well make use of it, right? Methane is a, a more potent greenhouse gas than CO2. So if we can not only capture it, but reuse it to generate stuff that would have otherwise needed to have come from fresh CH4, um, we're, we're sort of doing everybody a, a bit of a favor there, ourselves included, because we live on the planet too, um, of doing something useful with that gas. And on, on the downside, we're, we're sort of exchanging one greenhouse gas for another, but we're exchanging a worse greenhouse gas for a slightly better greenhouse gas. So it's still putting CO2 into the atmosphere. It's, it's not as good as like a solar cell or a wind turbine or something like that, um, but it's, it's definitely better than just letting the trash rot um, over in the, the landfill and all that CH4 comes out anyway. Um, so it, it is an improvement um, in that sense. But if, if you're interested in solar cells and stuff like that, we can, we can do better even than a, the fuel cell in terms of not um, putting out greenhouse gases. I'm not gonna go into too much more detail here. If, if you want a slightly longer discussion of a fuel cell, um, go back to our Canvas page. Um, and I've got another like 20 or 30 minute um, discussion of a fuel cell and I've got, I've got this little tiny baby fuel cell here that we take apart in that video and, and sort of look at all the various components and, and talk about where that shows up inside chemical engineering. This is actually an area of active research. Um, so you can very easily find PhD projects um, on various elements of fuel cells. The, the catalyst, the actual production of the fuel cell, you know, creating new membranes um, through which the, the charged species can go just modeling the fluid mechanics inside of there. It's coupled to a chemical reaction, a momentum balance, an energy balance, um, all, all sorts of mass transfer. Uh, it's, it's a really complicated system on the inside. So this, unlike the other equipment that we've seen so far, um, is one area where you could actually very easily do a PhD. Um, there's, there's plenty to work on with um, fuel cells. They're still uh, in, in the process of, of being developed. Uh, but if you are interested in uh, what that kind of stuff looks like. I'm just going to say see other video. Uh, and I'll just briefly mention, you know, the, the low value product here that is coming into the system is that biogas um, or that CH4, wherever that's coming from. And the high value product, this is a, a, another little miniature cogeneration plant. Um, so we're producing electricity and, and hot water with this system as well. Um, but all kind of, I mean, the, these fuel cells, they're silent when you stand next to them and there aren't any moving pieces from the outside anyway, but they are just stuffed to the brim uh, with, with chemical engineering. Um, so let's take a, a quick snapshot of this and we'll just add it to our running collection of um, snapshots. Throw that under our clipboard. Um, and now we're, we're going to wrap up in the next like 10 minutes or so with our uh, last, you, we would all call these, or we would call all of these unit operations, by the way. So our next piece of equipment um, is our last one, which is our chiller. So let's have Tom reintroduce us to the chiller here really quick. Can you, so when we see this outer shell on here, what's going on on the inside? Like if we could do a cutaway of it, what would we see? Okay, so this is the condenser. 
and that is the evaporator. The evaporator is insulated. The evaporator is where the chill water is. Okay. So up on top you have an electric motor and a compressor. The compressor is pulling pulling on the evaporator, pulling that refrigerant, making it low pressure. And that's what makes the temperature drop. The drop in pressure equals the drop in temperature. So that's where you drop the temperature and make the chill water. And then the compressor pushes out high pressure gas at a high higher temperature and it goes into the condenser. Well, the green is the condensing water flowing from the cooling towers, 73 degrees in and back out, and it condenses that vaporized refrigerant back into a liquid. And then down underneath, the liquid then flows back over through a set of control valves, maintaining levels in both. And then the liquid refrigerant here gets sucked into the bottom of the evaporator where the compressor is pulling on it and the compressor is pulling that vacuum so when the refrigerant gets in there it flashes and the flashing is what pulls the pressure down so if if we were to open up the the edge of this would it be one empty tube all the way through or there there's probably two, there's probably 1500 tubes and every year we pull this off we have a contractor do it. We pull this off, run a brush with water, and clean every tube. Wow. Because heat transfer is everything. And the fouling of tubes is loss of efficiency. So one thing that Tom just said right there is the fouling of tubes is loss of efficiency. You will actually calculate a coefficient called the fouling factor. Um, for heat heat exchangers because as that layer of scale or something builds up, the heat exchanger becomes less efficient at transferring, or I should say less effective at transferring energy from one stream to another. Um, so there's three different pieces of equipment, eh, probably two, um, that I want to uh, talk about here. First of all, the low value product to the high value product here um, is uh, fairly warm water, uh, which is coming back from the campus uh, is being transformed into cooler water, which can then be sent off to the campus to cool other equipment or to actually cool rooms if, if your room happens to require air conditioning of, of that particular uh, form. Um, but let's, let's look at two pieces that we can see very clearly and a third that's a little bit harder. Uh, and in fact, I kind of have to guess um, exactly where it is, but let's rewind just a little bit back right, here. This view um, that we've got right here is of the condenser. Um, so let's clean that off right here. I need to move my, oops. There we go. So let's grab our, uh, let's keep using pink. Um, this big element that we've got right here is called the condenser. How come my dot size too big? There we go. That's perfect. I don't know how that got switched. Uh, this is our condenser, right? So this is a heat exchanger. If um, I'm gonna pull up that, uh, actually, let's just pull it up right now. It is a heat exchanger and um, therefore it is generally structured in the way that we saw before, right? Which is this particular view. As Tom said, there's probably 1500 tubes in here. That's what he's talking about, right? Is, is this particular image. And also notice that there are two inlets and two outlets. That's very standard for virtually anything that is transferring heat back and forth, whether it's a condenser, an evaporator, a straight up heat exchanger, a boiler, whatever. Um, they've, they've all got this, this very similar structure to them. So if this is our uh, condenser, one of our inlets is over here which just from this drawing, I'm, I'm not exactly, I can't see any of the uh, indicators uh, as to which one is which, but I believe this one is our outlet and this is our inlet. So this is cool water from the cooling tower, right? The, the cooling tower outside would be sitting over here uh, and it would have our little fan sitting on top um, and it would be generating water, which would come through here. That water would heat up and then go out through, I think it comes through this pipe over here uh, and go into our cooling tower, right? So this is one big loop. Once it comes in through here, it's gonna flow inside those pipes. It's gonna go up here and make its U-bend 
uh, and come back through the heat exchanger like that, right? And that's all one big loop. The other fluid that is flowing inside of here is whatever our refrigerant is. I think Tom said that the refrigerant in here was R134A, R134A. But I don't know. Don't don't quote me on that because um, I, I don't remember exactly what it is. That refrigerant is flowing down through here, um, and it's running over the outside of these tubes, right? So that's occurring in what we call the shell. Um, remember, there's thousands of these tubes, uh, but eventually that coolant gets cooled down. Um, it started off warm up here, uh, and it gets cooled down a little bit more over here and eventually comes out through the bottom um, on this side. So this is our condenser. The stuff that is uh, of relevance inside of a condenser um, is, I shouldn't say the stuff, the material that you would learn in our class is relevant to a condenser, definitely thermo, um, definitely material and energy balances because you've got these flows going into and out of something. It's macro scale, right? This is obviously a, a fairly large piece of equipment. Um, 101A shows, rears its ugly head again because there's so much flow in pipes. So you're interested in friction and pressure drops and, and how much of a pump you need to actually pull these things through. Um, this is actually a gas, the, the stuff coming through the top is a gas. So it's a gas up here. Um, whereas the purple loop that I've got here um, is liquid water. Um, and so you'd have to transfer uh, energy back and forth between a liquid stream and a gas stream. Uh, that is right down the, the alley of 101B. Um, certainly there would be some controls in here as well, because as, as Tom's going to, or had mentioned previously, underneath here um, is a series of, of controls. So this is our condenser. Let's grab a picture of this really quick, um, just so we have our, our markup here. Um, and then we'll move to our other unit, and then we'll, we'll finish up with the, the one that I'm not quite sure about that's actually a, a really interesting one, and I would like to go talk to Tom and, and find out exactly where it is. Um, we'll, we'll come back to that one. So the, the other part, is, if that's the condenser, there's also an evaporator um, running on the other side of this thing. It's They always come in pairs, right? There's always a condenser and an evaporator whenever you're um, running a chiller. So let's skip over to about here. There we go. This is our um, evaporator, right? So this is working on the, the other side. That same fluid, let's clean this up, um, clear the screen. That other fluid is now coming in through the bottom of our um, evaporator, whatever our refrigerant is. That's what was coming out of the bottom of our condenser on the other side. Uh, it's flowing up through here. Remember, this is a gas uh, and coming up through here. And the idea is here it's cold and it got a little bit warmer up on the top. Um, and the reason for that is because this is another heat exchanger. So there's another series of tubes inside of here. Uh, the inlets and the outlets are actually right over here. And again, I, I can't see which way the arrows are going, so I could have these reversed. Um, in, this is the inlet and this is the outlet. This is our low value product and our high value product, right? Our, our low value product here is the, the water that's coming back from the campus that has already been warmed up for, for whatever reason. The outlet is our high value product because that's our now chilled water. Um, and so this water is running through another series of tubes, right? It comes in through here, runs way down our condenser, loops back around until it eventually leaves. Um, and our refrigerant, which is the, the thing that is, is doing the cooling, starts off cold. It flows over the outside of these tubes uh, and energy is transferred from the, the warm water coming in to this refrigerant. So the refrigerant gets a little bit warmer up here. Um, and then it hits that compressor, turns around and enters the condenser on the other side, right? You can't really see it, but it, it runs off over here uh, and sort of comes down over to that condenser on the, the other side of, of this image. Again, it's another heat exchanger. This one happens to be insulated because that's your product. So you're, you're really trying not to, to lose that. Um, notice the uh, refrigerant is actually running in a loop, right? It, it sort of runs around through that other unit over here um, and then eventually enters the bottom of this unit. But the refrigerant is just running in a loop 
right? Over and over and over and over again. Um, it, it is not exposed to any, hopefully it does not come out at all um, because it's, it's usually not um, very safe for anyone or anything uh, to be around. So this unit um, is called our evaporator. Uh, and just like um, the condenser over on the other side, uh, this one is obviously going to need some uh, material and energy balances, going to need some thermo, uh, going to need fluid flow, uh, heat transfer, and uh, I, as with almost everything, it's going to need controls, right? So you're going to encounter these sorts of, of topics there as well. The last part that is critical to these things functioning, and I'm sure it's in there somewhere, I'm just not sure exactly where. One of the things that Tom mentioned was the drop in pressure is the drop in temperature. The two are directly related. The compressor is actually making things a little bit worse, right? You, if, if the warm air is going in through the top, this air or this refrigerant over here is even warmer, right? Because it started off at low pressure and then it got compressed when it went through the compressor, right? Sitting up here on the top, um, is our compressor. So if it started off warm, it actually got warmer when it went to the other side. The pressure drop that um, is used to actually uh, reduce the temperature is um, achieved through what's called an expansion valve. Um, and so let's take a quick, I can't do that. No, I don't want to do that. There you go. Take a quick screenshot here, just so I'm going to post all of these um, afterwards, just in case anybody uh, wants them. Close this throw that on there. The last part is um, what's called an expansion valve, and I can at least show you where it is, where I, my best guess as to where it is, uh, is right, oh, Tom, move your hand. Underneath yes, underneath, liquid, thank you, Tom. Then there we go. Uh, can we get a slightly more, there, that's a good view. Um, this is the last portion that uh, I'm interested in, which is the expansion valve. So the expansion valve is somewhere in this image, um, and I just don't know exactly where it is, uh, but it is a key feature um, of any of these types of systems, is an expansion valve. They can be very simple or they can be fairly complex. It depends on whether or not they have a controller on them. I see two possibilities in this image, if it's in this image at all. One of them is that this little fella here, that could be an expansion valve, but just from the symmetry of, of how that looks, in fact, we can, no, I can't play it a little bit more. That may just be a flange. It, it may just be two pieces fitting each other or hitting each other and then bolted together but that could also actually be an expansion valve. If the valve is a little bit more complicated, then my guess is that the expansion valve is somewhere inside of here uh, because you wouldn't need that much insulation coming off the bottom of the pipe if it's just a, a big old piece of pipe sticking off of the bottom, right? And it's really suspicious to me that the pipe starts off up here, which is probably a foot in diameter, um, and then it gets reduced down to like a five inch pipe down here. That's a little suspicious to me, but it would be reasonable if the whole pipe is actually five inches all the way through here, uh, and then sitting inside of here is a valve. Um, that could be possible. So I'm, I'm actually going to say that this is my best guess, is that the valve is inside of here. Um, it would probably have a controller on it, um, which we would draw that way, but I'll just point to it um, and say, this is my best guess for where that expansion valve is. An expansion valve is, is nothing special, right? And that's the reason why I can't quite rule this one out. At its simplest, if you have a pipe running through here, and then you have another pipe running through right next to it, and you just put a piece of material in that almost closes it off, right? Not quite, I didn't quite close off that pipe, but it would be um, high pressure over here and low pressure over here. The high pressure stuff would come through and find its way through that little orifice uh, and then expand onto the other side, right? And that's your expansion valve. Usually if you were to look at the, the cross section of a, a slightly more complicated um, expansion valve, they would kind of sit in there um, like this. Right, so this would be the actual valve. And it would be um, attached to something over here that can move up and down, right? And as the, the valve goes up and down, you can imagine if, if this uh, material, if this is a solid wall, 
right? And this is all inside of your pipe, right? Here's a pipe and here's a pipe. And this is your high pressure over here. And this is your low pressure over here. The fluid flow is going in this direction. You can use a controller to adjust the, the opening in that um, orifice that's in here. And so the fluid would come in, flow through here, flow through here, uh, and be reduced in pressure by the time it comes out on the other side. That expansion is a giant portion of 102. So I'm going to put 102 over here um, so that you remember it. Thermodynamics, um, I guess purple is the easiest to see. 102 um, is this whole refrigeration cycle, a key portion of which is the expansion valve. Um, the compressor that we saw up on the top is I would say equally important. You kind of need all four of them. You need the condenser, you need the evaporator, you need the uh, compressor, and you need the expansion valve. I know where the condenser, the compressor, and the evaporator are, but I'm not quite sure where the expansion valve is. Um, so I'm going to take a brief snapshot of this here um, just so that we can put it over on our collection, um, and then I'll show you why I'm so sure I mean, you can just kind of take my word for it. I, I know it's got to be in there somewhere, uh, but it doesn't have to be very complicated. So it could be easy to hide, um, especially with all of that insulation on top of it. Um, the reason I'm so sure, uh, if we go over here and just give us a, a brief overview, all of these systems are essentially operating on this kind of a cycle. Right, you can just go look up chiller, right? Google chiller the same way that I just did. Um, and you'll see all of these uh, elements that we've got on here. It's, it's all, I, I don't want to say it's impossible because I, people are so much more clever than I am. I'm sure there's a way to do it without all of these components. Um, but nearly every time we have to have a compressor, we have to have a condenser, we have to have an expansion valve, and we have to have an evaporator. I, I want to say almost every time that's a requirement. It, it's, I'm sure there are other ones where the chilling system doesn't require that. Um, I'm just not familiar with them. Uh, and then we've also got our inlets and outlets, right? We've got one inlet coming here and one outlet over here. We've got another inlet over here and another outlet over here. So again, heat exchangers have two inlets and two outlets. Um, this process, if we were drawing this in 100, right, we could draw our primary control volume here and say, maybe I just want to look at it from an overarching view. Um, and so all I know is there's power coming in through a compressor up here, and there's two inlets and two outlets. Um, or we might draw a smaller, what we would call a control volume. Maybe we're just interested in the condenser, um, or maybe we're just interested in the evaporator over here. Right? Each of those subunits have their own inlets and outlets. Um, and so this one the, both the evaporator and the condenser would essentially have no shaft work going in or out of them. There's, they're well insulated, so they would be what we would call adiabatic. Same thing with the expansion valve on here. right? So this, this whole process, we set up the basis for it in 100, uh, but then we really go into detail in 102 about how efficient these sorts of processes can be. Um, it, it's, it's a big portion of, of 102. Okay, so those were our three um, elements that we saw three and a half, right? Because we we did see the um, fuel cell, uh, but I'm not going to go into details on the fuel cell because you can go check out that that other video uh, for the fuel cells. So the just as a, a brief review, the three that we had, there was this combination of a condenser and evaporator that we call a chiller. Um, it also has a compressor and a, a valve, an expansion valve on the bottom. We did kind of briefly go over our, our fuel cell. Um, cooling towers were a, a big one. Um, lots of chemical engineering inside of there. Uh, and then our last one was our um, sort of our, our overarching view of, of power generation through our process flow diagram, um, which shows up in, in all of our classes. The only thing I don't want you to walk away from with, with this overview is that this is all chemical engineers can do. What I want you to walk away from this with is an understanding of the things that we just saw can be viewed through the lens of a chemical engineer. Um, and so I've tried to demonstrate some of those to you. But don't take this as, if I get a job in chemical engineering, all I can do is work in one of these power plants. In fact, it's very unlikely that you will actually work in a power plant. But wherever you work, whether it's in research, you know, maybe you want to go over to medicine or you want to go over to biology uh, or you want to work in wastewater treatment or you want to work in um, clean water production, you know, reverse osmosis, something like that. 
it's all going to draw from these same concepts uh, in one form or another, right? If, if you're designing a new drug or something like that, which we're going to, our, our very last um, podcast with our, our program chair, Dr. Jang, he is involved in nanomedicine, right? And so we're going to talk to him about how chemical engineering influences what he does in nanomedicine, right? Nothing that we've done here really gets very close to nanomedicine um, with may, potentially the, the exception of some of the catalysts that we've been talking about. Um, so the um, catalyst that we had mentioned that sits inside of the fuel cell is at least conceptually similar because the scales are similar, right? They're, they're nanoscale catalysts, um, which is similar to what Dr. Jang works on. So don't take this as here's what chemical engineers do. Take this as here's a project which can be viewed through the lens of chemical engineering. Um, and you're going to you're gonna hit a lot of these topics through your um, undergraduate career um, with Dr. Jang. Uh, and actually, Dr. Chen, we're going to talk to him too a little bit about his research. Um, we'll see that there are lots of other applications of, of chemical engineering. Um, but at any rate, I hope that gives you um, a good idea of what you're in for, um, especially in, in this sense over the next few years directly in each of your classes as to what they'll be um, exploring in, in greater detail. So I'm going to wrap up the, the recording. I'm going to stick around a couple of minutes just in case anybody in chat has any questions. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and stop this recording. Don't forget, there are two more podcasts coming, right? We'll have Dr. Chen next week. Uh, and then our final podcast for the course will, as I said a moment ago, um, be with our department chair, um, or not our department chair, our program chair, um, Dr. Leon Fong Zhang. So stick around for those. Um, and if, absolutely, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact me. So I'm going to go ahead and stop this recording. Bye, everybody. Stay safe.